and going into speaker view. So, um, you know, should just be the speakers who are on. Um, yeah, uh, I wanted to just give a few um, announcements as executive director. We have a, um, a special event later this month, at Booth Transit Now Happy Hour, um, social hour that's at Optimism Brewing on Tuesday, uh, the 28th. And I will drop that link in the chat right now. Um, it, it is a just good chance to talk about trying to um, improve transit service in our region. Um, and we also have two great guests coming up um, for our virtual happy hours, our virtual um, meetings with, um, we have Andrew Lewis next month, normal times, uh, second Tuesday, which is the April 11th, um, 6.30 to 7.30. And then in May, second Tuesday, we have uh, CEO of Sound Transit, Julie Tim, and there's a lot to talk about there. Um, so those are our big events coming up. Uh, we're also excited, obviously, for the main speaker tonight, uh, Tammy Morales. Um, there's just going to be a ton to talk about um, between transportation, housing, uh, and everything else happening at City Hall and campaign-wise. Uh, but I want to give one last plug to also, um, you know, make sure you you weigh in with your local uh, San Transit board members um, because there's a huge decision before us. Um, by March 23rd, they are going to pick an alignment for the downtown light rail, the second line through downtown. And there's, you know, a wide variety of options. Um, the urbanists has signed on to the Move Forward with Fourth Coalition um, that is seeking to keep uh, the connectivity in Chinatown where there would be a union station hub. Um, and the other alternatives will involve worse transit service than there is now for uh, pe people living in the Rainier Valley. Also complicated transfers for East Like um, We have more on that on the website, so check out some of our articles. Um, but I just want to let people know that, that the clock is ticking on that decision show. Um, watch out for action alerts and um, also Make sure you weigh in while you can. Um, so with that, I'll pass it back to Patrick for the Q&A and to introduce the Morales. All right, thanks, Doug. Hey, we're very excited tonight to be joined by Council Member Morales um, from District 2, which runs from the International District south to city the city line, and then from Lake Washington, basically to the Duwamish River. Um, she has a great history as a in planning and community organizing prior to getting elected to City Council in 2019. And she's running for office again, but I'm going to hand it off to her to tell you about herself. And yeah, with that, take it away, Councilmember Morales. Great. Thanks so much, Patrick and Doug. Uh, good evening, everybody. Nice to see you all. Um, I, well, the first thing I need to do is to make one correction uh, to Patrick's description. Uh, District 2 has changed a little bit. We were just redistricted uh, last fall. And so it now includes Yesler Terrace. Uh, but it does not any longer include Georgetown and Soto. So I'm sad that I lost uh, lost the Duwamish, but um, but very excited to be uh, getting to know folks in the Gessler Terrace community. Um, I am Tammy Morales. Uh, I represent District 2. Um, I think the first thing I want to do is really just thank uh, all of you at The Urbanist. I really appreciate the um, the focus that you offer the city on how best to plan for um, healthy neighborhoods in the city. Um, that's the, my training is as a neighborhood planner. Uh, I went to UT Austin many moons ago. Um, and my work has really always revolved around kind of the intersection of public health and community economic development. So, um, I worked in affordable housing. Um, that was my first job here in Seattle, uh, working for an affordable housing lender. Um, I worked for quite some time as a food security consultant um, and did a lot of work with small businesses who are trying to increase the amount of fresh produce they were selling, uh, really trying to uh, support the connection between um, local neighborhood grocers, particularly in communities of color and our regional farming infrastructure. So trying to make sure that we're connecting 
uh, our, our local farmers to local stores. Um, there's a lot of infrastructure challenges that, uh, that are in place that really keep us from being able to access fresh local food. Um, so I did that for quite some time and that was really where I started working with the Seattle City Council uh, because we were trying at the time to start a, a local food action, uh, a food policy council that could help the city understand its very direct role in supporting food security in the city. Um, so I did that for a while and uh, and also worked as a community organizer uh, down here in the South End with Rainier Beach Action Coalition, worked with UFCW for a while. Um, and really just always uh, been engaged in supporting neighbors to understand that they have a role to play in how their government works, in how their neighborhoods change and grow, uh, and really need to be part of the conversation. Um, so that's why I went to planning school, because I really liked the idea of helping community members understand how to engage in, in the decision making that's happening to them very often instead of with them. Um, and so so that's the work that I've been doing um, at the city. Uh, I'm really focused right now for the foreseeable future on the comprehensive plan. Uh, really interested in, um, I, I do sit on the land use committee. I'm the vice chair of that committee. And so I am really interested in making sure that our office of uh, community planning, um, planning and community development uh, is, is, thinking carefully about how to address the history of redlining, the long-term impacts of redlining on our communities of color in particular. Um, <clears throat> and as we're moving forward with the comprehensive plan, what that means for the way we need to uh, uh, modify our urban growth strategy. Um, and then I'm sure it's no secret that I, I didn't intend to become kind of the pedestrian safety guru in the city, but given that uh, the district that I represent does uh, suffer 60%, uh, almost 60% of the traffic fatalities in the city, um, I really spent the last couple of years understanding better and trying to um, advocate with Sound Transit and with SDOT uh, for a real commitment to um, pedestrian safety and, and a commitment to actually building the infrastructure that we need to make sure that our neighbors are safe as they try to get around their communities. Um, so that's uh, a little bit about where I come from and the things that I'm focused on uh, in the next couple of years and uh, look forward to our conversation today. Great, thank you so much. Um... Let's start with a maybe a simple and but broad question. Why um, a lot of your council members, other your fellow council members, have chosen not to run? Um, what, 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 are, what are you? What's motivating you to keep going? What's what's that? Uh... Yeah. Well. Um, yeah. I mean, there's. This, so this was my first term. Uh, within fifty. 55 days of uh, of getting to city council, getting to city hall, we all had to turn around and go home. Um, and so it has definitely been challenging. You know, I don't, I was certainly not expecting, you know, crisis after crisis, a global pandemic and the racial reckoning and protests in the streets. And all of that was very challenging. Um, and when you couple that with who we had in uh in the White House at the time and all of the stuff that came out of that, um, it really did create an, a, 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 an environment that is, it's been tough, I'm not gonna lie. Um, you know, as, so there's all of that. Um, the reason I'm staying, the reason I think it's important to, uh, to commit to sort of double down on the work that we have to do is because I represent a part of town that has historically been underinvested in. Um, it's a part of town that has the same kind of challenges that every neighborhood in the city has, um, but also has a, a lack of investment. And um, part of the reason I ran for council in the first place several years ago was because I did see that the council seemed to be um, rep not representing the needs of the South End very well, um, uh, or communities of color, uh, broadly speaking. And so 
I'm proud of the work that I've been able to do um, for the last few years, whether it's, you know, protecting workers or affordable housing or, you know, really elevating the discussion about the need to invest in in uh, in infrastructure that keeps our neighbors safe. I'm proud of all that work, but it's not done. There's a lot of work to do still. Um, and particularly as we're starting to talk about the comp plan and we'll be making those decisions next year, that's a conversation I wanna be part of. And it's a conversation that I really wanna to try to influence um, so that the people of district two can really benefit from all that the city can be offering um, and, and can really benefit from the kinds of investments and, and security that are and, and health and access to opportunity that folks in the other parts of the city can benefit from. So um, there's a lot of work to do still and I wanna be here to do it. Excellent, yeah, indeed. Um, I was gonna save this question for later but it seems like a natural point right now. Um, when you ran for office the first time you ran against our current mayor yeah. Um, and then, then you almost won and then you ran against him again and he chose not to run um, and and you got the seat. Now that you're in the position of of working with him day to day and he he's, has a vision for the city, it seems. Um, how do you feel like that direction, his direction is going and how do you feel like he's working with the council? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you for that question. I think I will say. Um, Things are much better now. <laughs> uh, you know, I my first two years were tough. Um, it was, it was. I, I'm sure it's no surprise to anybody uh, who's been paying attention to these particular kinds of issues that it was really hard under the previous administration to get to get good work done. Um, and um, and I think we all suffered from it. Um, I think our departments suffered from it. Uh, you know, our city workers were, were trying really hard to be good public servants, but it's uh, when you've got an executive branch that is, um, is not on the same page, it's hard, it's hard to do good things. And so um, I will say that <clears throat> last year was, uh, you know, I, I think as the city, we just felt the tone kind of shift. We felt a little bit of a sigh of relief. Um, and, you know, I, I think the mayor and I uh, are clear where we have alignment and clear where we don't have alignment. Um, there are just places where we're going to have to agree to disagree and um, and continue to work as best we can on the policies that we can agree on. So, um, you know, I appreciate the open communication. I appreciate that um, I have, I do have a good relationship with uh, Deputy Mayor Harrell and with uh, Deputy Mayor Wong. And so it is, it is much easier for me to talk with the executive branch about the things that are important for the district or for the city as a whole. And it's also easier to just say, uh, I'm gonna have to go a different direction on that and know that um, there will be no penalty <laughs> uh, for having a different policy opinion. Well, that's good to hear. And that's uh, encouraging that you have a good working relationship, um, even if you don't see eye to eye on, many, on a lot of things. Um, so pivoting to more land use questions, uh, it seems clear to a lot of us that housing is one of the biggest problems in the city, in the city housing affordability. And it's the root cause of many of the issues that we care about, displacement, um, homelessness. Uh, if you're poor, it's a life and death issue. If you're, even if you have money, you, you feel the pinch. Um, I'm, a, I'm not a knee-jerk council critic. I look forward to voting for you in the fall, but I also sometimes I feel like the council is, you know, not taking this crisis with the level of seriousness and urgency that it that it seems. Um, what what do you see? What do you think the city and the council should be doing to um, make housing more affordable, um, slow displacement, keep people you know inside? That's a big question, Patrick. <laughs> um, Maybe I'll start with the with the anti displacement work because that is that is a huge part of why I uh, got into office or why why I was seeking office um, because there is a lot of <clears throat> as as I know we all know you know between the urban growth 
strategy, the history of redlining in the city, um, the, the um, equitable financing policies, all the things that, that contribute to communities of color, not having access to wealth and not having access to generational wealth, to home ownership opportunities. Those are the things that are contributing to people getting pushed out of the city. Um, and so it's important that as, particularly as we're talking about the comp plan, that we kind of weave through the whole process anti-displacement strategies. Um, so what kind of alternatives can we create that can allow, um, you know, economic inclusion, uh, for preservation of cultural space, preservation of physical space that allow people to stay in their communities. I do think we need to be incorporating these um, this analysis and, and developing strategies throughout. Uh, we need that, my hope is that that process ends with some very explicit recommendations, but I think that it needs to be community driven and community led, the kinds of investments that we make in a community. This is part of why the equitable development initiative was created so that um, the decisions about how investments get made uh, include the priorities of the folks who have historically been pushed out. Um, so, I mean, we we have a crazy real estate market that also contributes to displacement. So, um, so at least some of the strategies need to include things like taking land out of the speculative market, keeping it in community land trusts, um, the social housing PDA that we just passed as a city, 66% of people in the South End voted for that. Um, so, you know, doing things that can support community ownership, support um, uh, long-term pr preservation of affordability for uh, for neighbors is a, I think, is going to be a really huge piece of that, and something that I'm I am um, very interested in continuing to work on. Uh, there are several different organizations around town that are working on things like community investment trusts, community land trusts. Um, hmm. uh, you had another question besides <laughs> displacement, but. Uh, it was it was just a broad question about how how to make housing more afford, affordable and you know reduce displacement. So it was, it was pretty open ended. Um, yeah. So yeah. I think those are you know the ways that we um, the, the ways that we make opportunity increase opportunity for folks whether it's to rent something that is affordable to them, i.e. you know uh, permanent affordability with. Uh, tools like social housing, um, or increase home ownership opportunities, uh, or take land out of the speculative market. Those are the things that are going to really change the system that is working against people being able to stay in the city. On top of that, we know that we just have not kept pace with construction of housing. I think we we need something like over twenty thousand units. Uh, just for folks who are under 80% AMI right now. So we haven't been building enough uh, for decades. And then you add on top of that, the historic growth in the city in the last 10, 15 years, which we did not anticipate. And we've got a real crisis on our hands. So um, I know you had a, a King County Council Member Balducci on recently. Um, we sit on the PSRC Growth Management Policy Board together. Um, and a lot of the work that's happening um, there is to try to address with not just Seattle, but with the municipalities across King County, what the um, how to create the housing targets for each community um, and how to make sure that through our planning processes across the county and really across the state, we're all doing everything we can to make sure that the capacity to build is there. Uh, and then, of course, we have the question of actually making sure that the development happens. Um, so that can also get into, you know, streamlining the permitting process and getting rid of design review and all the other things we need to do to make this happen faster. Um, I was talking to somebody today. I can't remember who, uh, who was mentioning that, um, you know, they were talking to a developer in Tacoma who said, you know, it's six months from purchase of property to permitting and getting their project moving. And I was like, wow, six months. <laughs> it's 
if only, you know, we really need to change some of the things that are getting in the way of us being able to produce at a rate that we need to produce so that we can make sure that people have a place to stay because uh, it's not okay that we have so many people living on the street and it's not okay that we have so many people who are really rent burdened and it's not okay that so many families uh, and, and people are just leaving the city and leaving the area because they can't afford to be here anymore. Thanks. Um, as much as I want to, <clears throat> I'm an architect in my day job. I mean, it's, I think it's like two years to get a permit or something yeah. in, in the city, basically. And yeah. As much as I want to ask more questions about streamlining the um, permitting process, I think I should probably keep moving. Um, but I, I want to, I do want to talk about social housing. Um, it's, it seems like you and your office were the biggest cheerleaders for it on the council. Um, and maybe there's some of your colleagues are a little more skeptical. So I just wanted to, you know, get your vision for how it will be implemented and what you think it yeah. will mean. Um, I know, and correct me if you're wrong, were you, you, did you try to get money in the budget for um, setting up the office in the last year? Twice. In the fall. <laughs> yeah. I tried two years in a row to get, um, get this, organized, created within the Office of Housing. Um, and, you know, that was really the, that was the initial idea. That was the initial strategy was to try to get funding to create something like this uh, within the city. Um, and so, yeah, we tried the first year, uh, I think 2021, um, honestly, like I couldn't even get a second. So we did not even have the discussion in council about what social housing is and what benefit it could play in addressing some of the things that, that we're talking about tonight. Uh, last year, I got a few supporters, um, but still not enough to actually create a funding stream uh, for the Office of Housing. And so um, I think after that, um, you know, well, after 2021, when, when, I, when I couldn't get something in, I think is when, uh, and in response to the Compassion Seattle debacle, uh, is when folks really started coalescing around this idea of creating an initiative to do it, to do it different. I read out for a long time. I think I've probably talked with some of you about the um, trip that my staff and I took to Nantes, our sister city in France, where we, we really went on kind of a research project um, to talk with folks there about how social housing works, how they finance it, how they construct it, who gets to live there, why are they doing this? And we really came back with, um, uh, you know, a fervor for trying to make something like this happen here because the whole idea is that, uh, you know, it is it is not about public housing as we know it in this country. It is not about isolating low-income folks in one building or one neighborhood or one part of the city. The idea is to, to mix folks who come from across, uh, you know, an income spectrum, come from uh, a spectrum of, of experiences to, to create an intentional community where people may be different, they may have different backgrounds, they may have different incomes, but they're still serving their community together, working and, and sharing their neighborhood. So that's sort of the lofty idea. Um, as far as the initiative itself, we, you know, uh, 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 while it was on the ballot or before it was on the ballot, we couldn't really talk about it as individual council members because we're, it's a citizen led initiative and we're not supposed to comment one way or the other in our, in our professional capacity. Um, but on our personal time we can. And so, yeah, I did, uh, I volunteered, I canvassed with them, um, and really supported the idea of creating something like this, because I think it's an important alternative to the way we do things now. It's not intended to replace the way we do affordable housing. It's not intended to replace anything. It's just intended to, to create another option. Um, and one that can ensure permanent affordability because the whole initiative is, is premised on uh, the construction of these projects happening on city owned land with, you know, permanent ownership by, of the land by the city. Um, so implementation, uh, the, the initiatives passed, uh, it is coming through my committee for uh, appointment, the appointment process. Um, 
the initiative states that there will be 13 board members that govern the, the Public Development Authority, but council only uh, approves two of those appointments. So the rest of the appointments uh, don't have to come through my committee. Just, I think there's been a little bit of confusion about that. There are other appointing entities and they can choose their appointment process. It can be an open application. They can just decide who they think it should be um, and then present those. That will go through council in the shape of a clerk file, but, um, but only the two council appointees come through my committee. That all gets uh, finalized by April 25th by the full council. Um, all 13 get approved or, or finalized by the full council. And then we have another 30 days to convene the first board meeting. Um, so probably by end of May. And, and then, you know, the board is sort of off and running and their first task really is going to be hiring staff, uh, you know, drafting bylaws, starting their fundraising process and really starting to do the work of creating the agency. Um, and, you know, I think within the first year or so, my hope is that they are able to acquire a property or two, but I think it's going to be important for us to give them time to really establish uh, you know, hire the right people, understand their bylaws, make sure that they are on solid footing, um, and then gradually scale up what they're able to do. And that's going to take some time. I don't, uh, anybody who's started a nonprofit knows that it's a lot of work just to get the thing going. Excellent. It's going to be real exciting to see what it does. Um, watch what happens over the next year. Uh, <clears throat> so you, you'd mentioned the comprehensive plan and mm -hmm. we're, we're in the midst of it, you know, the, um, the city should be, was it releasing its prefer, it's uh, the alternatives for the EIS soon? Am I, am I it's, correct? it's coming soon. Mm -hmm. I will admit, uh, I just had a meeting with OPCD, but I can't remember their timeline exactly. I'm uh, on a, yeah. I'm on an AI committee that deals with it and we, we have to relook it up every single time. It's, <laughs> it's always, yeah. um, but there's a there's been a range of options presented, um, and then I know activists have pushed for uh, option six, which is more intense housing, and then um, so I want to get your opinion on that. But I want to fold into the, the question. I know you tried to get a bunch of initiative and uh, comprehensive plan amendments passed this year, focused on neighborhood commercial and fifteen minute cities mm -hmm. and making uh, like making making the city more accessible for people walking biking. Um, using transit in their neighborhoods. Can you yeah. talk about your what, what you hope to see come out of the process, and also um, what you what you the the goal was with your amendments? Yeah. Um, so I did put in several. I can't remember how many amendments last year, and um, the the point there was, I guess it was twofold. One, it was to to uh, signal my interest in creating effectively, yeah, you know, a 15 minute city. And so um, over the last couple of years, as I talked to, particularly talked to small businesses in uh, my district, I'm hearing a lot, uh, I'm thinking about folks like up on Beacon Hill where duplexes, there's lots of duplexes before they were, uh, you know, prohibited, they're still there, people still live in them. There's a lot of small commercial, what used to be commercial spaces that have now been converted into housing or, um, you know, converted into some sort of neighborhood use. But because commercial space is not allowed there anymore, they're not allowed, retail isn't allowed, for example. So after talking to lots of folks, um, there is there is a desire to go back to the idea of having multiple commercial nodes throughout a neighborhood um, and the ability to use some of those spaces that had been created for that purpose in the past, be able to go back and use them like that again. Um, so, so last year, um, you know, with those ideas in mind, how do we, how do we uh, create housing throughout the city? How do, how do we create more uh, neighborhood commercial nodes throughout the city? 
we put a, a suite of amendments in for the um, annual comp plan process. And, you know, what we heard back from OPCD is these are great, but you know, we're having the, the comp plan review itself. We want to have this conversation as part of that broader conversation. I look at it as basically alternative six. <laughs> um, you know, the kind of things that we were talking about wanting to create are that, um, you know, moving away from an urban growth strategy that really targets every, all multifamily along, solely along transit corridors, moving away from, uh, you know, putting commercial uh, uh, zoning only along uh, transit corridors and really sort of broadening out what we're able to do. So, um, and so that's why it was easy for me to, uh, to support the alternative six idea, because I do think that um, it, is, it is a much healthier kind of environment for our young people, for our seniors who are looking for the opportunity to age in place, for um, just creating the kind of neighborhood that allows people to know one another. Um, those are those are the the broad, lofty goals that I have with wanting to support um, a change in our land use, uh, a change in our zoning that really supports thriving communities better. Muted. Uh, thank you for that answer. And then also, I knew you had a whole series of uh, like public learning sessions with, under the Seattle Within Reach. Mm -hmm. Am I correct on that? Yeah. Yep. So, and it's it's great. You've been one of the most seemingly the, one of the most engaged council members on the process, and really tried to pull um, your constituents in and provide some education about it before uh, before the process even started. Yeah, that and that was the goal um, because I knew that it was coming, and um, and we really wanted to help community members understand what is the comp plan, why should I care, well, how does it influence my day to day life, and so we started this series of uh, community panel discussions. Um, that we're calling Seattle within reach, and the idea is that we want to create healthy, vibrant communities where all of your uh, essential goods and services are available uh, within reach. Um, so if you, you know, a child care center, a grocery store, the post office, a credit union, um, you know, a health clinic, all of that uh, is what helps you stay in your community, navigate your community safely, and, and give you the, uh, the, I, I guess I'm thinking about a couple of things for for seniors in our community allows them to access everything they need, you know, within walking distance. I'm also thinking about kids, um, you know, kids who can navigate their neighborhood safely are autonomous kids. And that's that's great. Um, you know, my son takes the bus everywhere. He's 15. He doesn't drive yet. And he can get himself to Soto and Capitol Hill and, you know, the CID and, and to school. Um, and, and I don't have to drive him, which is great. <laughs> um, he gets to know the city. He gets to know our bus system. He gets to know how to, you know, navigate around anyway. So the idea with the Seattle within reach series is to help neighbors understand the different elements of the comp plan. Here's why it matters because this is all about how our transit system is going to get set up. It's all about transportation and how your, you know, streets are working in your neighborhood. It's all about housing. It's all about the environment and climate change and trees and access to clean water and clean air and noise pollution. It's all about uh, utilities. Um, it's all about economic development and what kind of small businesses are able to be in your neighborhood and what kind aren't and why aren't they allowed to be there? Why why is it that we only have grocery stores that are 40,000 square feet and we have so few uh, grocery stores that sell ethnic food, culturally appropriate food? Um, so that's not a problem in the South End, but, um, and so I just wanted to provide an opportunity for people to really start to think about um, the, the different ways that local government affects their neighborhood 
and to help people understand that they can say something about it and they can be engaged in this process and they can make sure that their leaders and the people who will be, you know, um, responsible for implementing this growth. It's important that those folks hear from people directly. And so that was the idea behind the Seattle Within Reach uh, series. We have another one coming up soon. Uh, this one's going to be all about uh, arts and culture, and I'm looking forward to that. So we'll we'll be sending something out soon about that discussion. And, and all the past ones are still available on your website for people who want yes. to watch them, correct? Yeah. So we've had uh, five, six. Uh, we had one in February around uh, climate change, that kind of, sort of the intersection of the comp plan and um, and environmental justice. Uh, and then this month's is going to be about arts and culture. Excellent. Um, so I want to switch to transportation because we're burning through our time. And I also I want to still want to make it to public safety by the end. But um, okay. as you said, you've, 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 you've uh, sort of stumbled into being the bike ped safety person on the council um, because you, you represent District 2, which has several of the most dangerous streets in, in the city. And I live just south of Othello between Rainier and MLK. So I, mm. I, I, I feel it. I see the speeding cars. My street has no sidewalks. Um, what, what's, what's your vision and what do you, how do you hope to get there for making our, the street safer? Ooh, um, well, I think, uh, immediately what we need is, uh, a lot more traffic calming, a lot more, um, I, I, I'm not a traffic engineer, so I don't know all the jargon, but you know, I'm thinking quick builds. So um, ways that we can make sure that we, uh, I mean, down here, you know, we have three, four major arterials that are straight shots through the Rainier Valley, through Beacon Hill, going into downtown. These are long, wide, straight streets that are not safe for anybody who's not in a car, and they're not safe for anybody who's trying to cross those streets. Um, and we don't have enough crosswalks, signals, uh, you know, ways for people to slow down. Now we do, we have had some, uh, a little bit of a road diet on Rainier on through Columbia City. That has been hugely impactful. It really has slowed people down. It is, you know, people don't crash into buildings anymore. Like, I mean, it was happening, it felt like once a week for a while there. Um, but it's only in the that, you know, four, five, six blocks uh, of Rainier. And, um, and so, I, you know, I would like to see the Department of Transportation really uh, move toward, and, and I, I think it's happening. You know, the new director has only been there for a few months. I do think that he's committed to, uh, to safety as a priority for the department. Um, but I would like to see a lot more done to make it safe for people to cross the street, to, to walk down the street, uh, you know, I'm obviously interested in uh, more protected bike lanes throughout the city. I think a, a short term thing that we could do with regard to protected bike lanes is we have all these segments of bike protected bike lane or maybe protected, but at least paint and post, at least something to acknowledge that there are people who bike who are on the streets. But they're just these little segments. Um, and so connecting each of them so that there is an actual way for people to get through a neighborhood would be great. I, I rode my bike to work today. This is not my first time riding my bike, but because this, the, the wayfinding is so bad, I, I lost it. I lost the neighborhood greenway twice <laughs> going and coming. Um, and so, you know, just making it easier for people to be able to get around is going to be really important. Um, the the most recent example I've seen in community is I was at um, South Shore Elementary School uh, about a month ago over on Henderson uh, between MLK and Rainier. There's three schools on Henderson. Uh, I was there in the after school time with the crossing guard and the principal and some of the parents. And I mean, I stood there and watched as 
cars kind of slow rolled through the crosswalk, uh, you know, honked at the crossing guard because he was trying to make sure that kids got across the street safely. And so um, driver behavior is certainly a part of the problem. And the geometry of our streets needs to change so that it is not so easy for people to haul ass down the street. Yes, I 100% I agree. Um, and maybe this is a question for us, Dot, but I, I do want to follow up on that just because um, I think right now like I, I bike, walk, drive, take transit through the valley and um, even when they've lowered the speed limits on Rainier and MLK, essentially no one except myself when I'm in a car does 25 miles an hour. That includes city buses, police cars, park department cars, yeah. um, any anyone. And then the, the you know, the bus, I, I bike down Rainier sometimes on the, the road diet section, just the road diet section. But there's a, a bike, a bus lane I might use for part of it, but that's the passing lane that people yes, do 45 it is. in. So, um, and then, you know, the, the answer I hear is always, you know, well, we need to redesign the roads, but um, I was on the bike board previous to, uh, until recently, and then the city, I think, was supposed to have started the Beacon Avenue bike lane, bike, bike project at this point, the Georgetown to South Park bike project, the MLK, Judkins Park, Mount Baker, um, Vision Zero project includes the bike lane. And it seems like they're, it's, and, and that's to say nothing of the fact that half our city still, you know, doesn't have sidewalks after 80 years mm -hmm. being in the city. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm always just so like, concerned that that like how do we get get this road redesigns done and what yeah yeah I have the same questions um, I do think that the Beacon uh, Beacon project is moving ahead finally um, mm -hmm. I was at the Beacon Hill Community Council last week and uh, Estot was there talking about they they've renamed it it's now a safety project which I yep. think is part of the challenge right. I mean, honestly, part of the part of the issue is that we, um, and I, and I've heard this from Director Spots himself. Like, why do you give people so many opportunities to tell you they don't like something? <laughs> uh, which is what we do with housing too, right? What we do with our permitting processes. So there is a point where, if we are particularly if we're talking about a safety project. We can have influence, community engagement to let folks know the problem we're trying to solve. And then we can design some solutions and we can say, here are some of our solutions, which one, but we're still gonna solve the safety problem. And so I think we have to make that shift because we can't, it, it, it's not okay for community members to be able to say no to something that can save lives. Um, and I think that's where, where we struggle. Um, it makes people mad and I understand that. And that is due to, you know, the 60 years of prioritizing cars that we have had as a culture in this country. And that's going to take some time to change, but we have to start making that change because it is not okay that almost 60% of the people who die in this city from traffic violence are dying here. Um, and so I, I, I understand the, the frustration. I understand the, um, where people are coming from in terms of not wanting to see some of these bike lanes built. Um, and, uh, and my priority remains, uh, preserving lives. So um, that's the conversation we'll have to keep having. Well, that's, um, that's great and very well put. And I hope, hope you keep fighting the good fight for that. I know it's, uh, it's a, it's a long-term process. Um, Doug brought up the uh, ST3 um, expansion and how it will affect uh, travel from the Valley. And I, don't, I didn't check, but I don't, I don't think you're one of the city members of the sound transit governing board but, no that's uh well the mayor and council president yeah but i'm sure you have oh, opinions and i know you on the one hand you represent the chinatown international district a neighborhood that has been brutalized by uh various government projects yeah. for generations and has a lot of um 
skepticism and concern and sort of a lot of promises over the years. Um, on the other hand, Sound Transit is a generation, you know, investment's a generational project that will be with us for, and if you look at, you know, other metro systems around the world, hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. uh, so how, and how do we balance those concerns? Um, and do you have an opinion about what should happen um, with that station location? Um, I am working through this myself, I'll say. Um, so I have had conversations with Sound Transit. I've talked to uh, Council Member Juarez. Uh, my staff has been in touch with the mayor's office. And then we're, we are trying to hear from, uh, it feels like there's maybe two, two sides so far in the, uh, in the CID. So we're trying to make sure that we're talking with everybody about what their concerns are. Um, I will say, um, hmm. I don't think anybody's terribly happy with any of it, to be honest. Uh, you know, there are there are concerns on all sides. Uh, you know, we've heard that Fourth Avenue is risky, that it's very expensive, um, and and uh, you know, I think the real issue is the the fear of and I think it's a legitimate fear, the fear of displacement of folks who live in the area, regardless of you know which station is chosen, um, and fear of particularly with the fourth or fifth of displacing businesses. And to your point, Patrick, you know, this is a community that has had generations of government projects imposed upon them. Um, and I think there is a question about why why they should be expected to bear the burden of, you know, very long construction time, traffic rerouting. So all that to say, um, you know, I think, I don't think there's huge joy about any of the options that are presented. And, um, you know, I know there's conversation about the North and South station as well. There are folks who are very interested in, avoiding that construction uh you know I, I, the, the questions about uh redevelopment are maybe a separate issue um but i think for it's really about holding sound transit accountable regardless of what decision they make to repairing the harm done to that community um and making sure that we are activating at least activating the Jackson hub space that's going on uh you know the the commitment to activating the Jackson hub space so that there is the opportunity for retail and uh um you know more um vibrancy in that part of the the neighborhood um it's a lot of work to be done still. I know they're they're making a decision soon. Um, and as I said, I'm talking with um, folks who are advocating for both and really for myself, just trying to understand what the concerns are and what potential mitigation strategies are. Because regardless of which one of these is chosen, that's just you know one piece of the work that has to happen. There will still be a lot of work to make sure that strong mitigation measures are in place and that there is also a strong community benefit package um, so that there is there's a good reason uh, from the community's perspective about accepting either one of these uh, options. Hmm. That's, a, that's an interesting perspective, especially thinking about that stretch of Jackson between Pioneer Square and the idea that sort of a no person's land of roads and exposed train tracks and it's kind of a rough rough transition um well i want to we're run, getting towards the end but i do want to ask you about um public safety and you know we we had a the moment as you alluded to um is it two years ago now of black lives matter um really becoming a, a major issue that people were more aware of um and trying to look at how we're currently doing policing. There's been, uh, just like I guess with the roads and trying to do street safety, there's there's been a look at like, how can we do an alternate um, public safety? But in Seattle fashion, it's, it seems like there's continued 
discussion and discussion and discussion. Um, but there doesn't seem to be much progress made on alternatives to policing being stood up yet. I know there seems like maybe there's a promise that this year will be the year. Yeah. Um, could you just talk about what your vision would be for public safety and how it affects the South End, your district, and um, where you think it's going right now? Yeah. Another big um, question, sorry. Well, I think there's a few things that come to mind. The first is we absolutely need to stand up an alternative to to uh, sending the police out for dealing with, you know, what is, uh, you know, a mental health crisis or substance use disorder crisis. Um, because that they're not social workers, they're not case managers. You know, if we are serious about trying to provide support to folks who are experiencing that kind of a crisis, then we need to put on the street people who know how to deal with that and provide the the place for folks to go. You know, I'm excited to about this um, King County initiative to build the five crisis centers. And uh, I, I'm sure you've had a conversation with the county about that already, but but you know we need we need that and we need the alternative system in the city and you know it's really frustrating that we've been talking about this for 3 years other cities have talked about it and done it and are now like 2 years into their projects so there's no reason why we can't get this done by the summer um that's my hope is that that thing is stood up um because in the absence of something like that, what's happening is that the police are responding. And we know the police have said themselves that they don't want to do that anymore. And by the way, we've got, you know, these increasing 911 response times. And so if we want to solve both of those problems, the answer is get the police out of that work so that they can go respond to their 911 calls. And let's stand up something that actually provides the kind of service and support that people need in order to get out of this crisis. So those are two things that I think are really connected and both really need to happen. Um, as far as it relates to the South End, you know, part of the public safety um, work that is happening down here is around, uh, somewhat around gun violence and around uh, youth violence that is happening. Um, you know, I go back to one of the first things I talked about, which is that this is a part of town that has historically been underinvested in historically dealing with issues around, you know, lack of affordable housing, lack of, lack of access to opportunity. Um, we need, I sit on the board of health. I probably should have said that at some point too. Um, and so I think those kind of challenges, we, we have to take a public health approach to solving. Um, and so we as a city and as a county, for example, have invested in the regional peacekeepers uh, collective interruption programs, uh, things that can, uh, you know, use trusted, credible messengers to move people away from a crisis situation and really help put them on a different path. But that's still not, that's still re reacting to the issue of violence in the community. I think if we really want to solve those problems, we have to invest upstream. We have to invest in the things that can really change the community conditions that lead to violence in the first place. And when we're talking about our young people, that means investing in high quality education, mentorship programs, late night teen programs at the community center, um, you know, making sure that there's uh, high school and college counselors investing in pre-apprenticeship programs and apprenticeship programs and making sure that for the students who may not have college in their future or not interested in college, that they still have a good union paying, you know, benefits and wages so that they can still have a career and, and a career that will allow them to support themselves and their family. So, you know, when I think about public safety, I I think there, there are a lot of ways to talk about public safety that have nothing to do with the police. And that's what I think we really need to invest in if we're looking to change these bigger systems. So, you know, I came from uh, organizing um, and in, in organizing spaces, you hear a lot about wanting to dismantle systems and tear down systems that are oppressing people but you spend 80% of your time doing that. 
The other 20% you spend building the future that you want to see and building the systems that can replace that. And I think that's the conversation we need to be having. So, um, you know, public safety means a lot more than just police. It means safety from oppression. It means safety on the streets. It means safety from racism. It means safety from poor access to healthcare. And if we change the neighborhoods, and this is why I'm so excited about the opportunity for the comp plan to really help us start building healthy neighborhoods, because what that means is we're creating a space where people have access to the essential things that they need to thrive. And that's how we're going to start to change some of these other community conditions that are leading people down a path that doesn't serve them and doesn't serve their families. Great. Thank you for that. And I think we're right almost at 7.30. My last question is, if um, so you know, you're here as a candidate and not a council member, if if pe people heard you talking today and were like, I am so excited about making sure that Tammy Morales stays in office, um, what can they do to help your campaign? Oh my gosh, so many things. Uh, <laughs> you can go to our website, which is votefortammy.com. Uh, you can endorse. There's a there's several buttons on there. You can endorse. You can donate. Uh, we're having a kickoff on April 6th, Thursday, April 6th at Southside Commons in the evening. Please come out to that. Bring your democracy vouchers. I'm participating in that program. So you can uh, donate your democracy vouchers to the campaign. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say is um, we're always looking for volunteers. So, you know, we've, we'll be knocking on doors uh, always need people to help knock doors for us. You can host a democracy voucher party if you want to gather your friends and neighbors. I'm happy to come out and talk with, with them. Um, and if they like what they hear, uh, we'll take your democracy vouchers. <laughs> Excellent. Sounds like so many things people can do. So um, many things. And with, with that, thank you so much for your time tonight. I know you're a very busy person, um, and but we, and you're, even with your, your voice being strange, um, you have so many great answers. And then speaking as, not as in the urbanist, not as in the urbanist endorsement committee, but as an individual, I'm very excited to be voting for you again as my council member. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much. It's been great having your representation. Uh, well, I appreciate that. I appreciate this conversation. Um, thank you all for what you do to make sure that people are really thinking critically about issues like land use. Uh, it's not the sexiest thing. I can geek out on it all day, but um, but I know not everybody gets it. So I appreciate that you're regularly elevating what exactly that means for our neighbors and why they should pay attention. Excellent. Thank